as you all know that you know in class I've been saying that translation is a bigger than just one language to another language translation, right? And today we're going to see for sure, right? We see how an artist, a technologist, Michael Malu, is being uh, innovative thinker in one sense, interdisciplinary thinker, how he brings together art, filmmaking, writing, he's a writer as well, and how he brings all of that and blend it with technology. And that's the fascinating part for Michael's work. Uh, he's a co-founder, or a founder of Red Earth Project, which we will learn today. Uh, he's given many lectures at many different universities, um, and feel free to engage with him. It's a fascinating area that he's working on. And how does he, I mean, he's a Yoruba native speaker, um, and he grapples with the problem of how do you translate ontologies in one language that is Yoruba to something that, uh, you know, Western Western languages, and how do they enforce that? We've gone through that in uh, interlingual approach translation, and this is the perfect segue into that, right? Take it away, Michael. And thank you. You're on mute, Michael. There we go, classic. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I'm delighted and honored to speak with you all today. So thank you, Srinivas, for this uh, gracious invitation. Um, I will preface this talk by saying I'm not a scholar of statistics, mathematics, or computer science, but I'm a keen observer and I'm a reader. So I apologize in advance for any technical errors. Um, so I guess my work is often focused on engaging openly and creatively, and most importantly, critically with new technologies. And in echo in technical data analysis, I try to acknowledge what has come before to effectively reflect on and build, in, build on what is to come. And maybe if it is ever possible, go beyond the boundaries of capitalist commodity exchange, the focus of so much computational development. Red Earth, the project I will introduce today, is less a display of my technical virtuosity, but rather a speculative theoretical exercise, a what if, if you like, which might serve as the foundation for continued study. This project is for the most part um, a question. I'm asking if methods of computational translation can speak to the intangibles of language, namely the metaphysics of language, if we're thinking of time, space, material, body, and being, through which many different cultural lineages have established their understandings of life, death, and relationship to the non-human world and the climate specific to their lands of origin. I'm asking if the imbalanced power dynamics of translation where some languages have been and are being suppressed or even lost altogether, and other languages remain ascendant through imposition, maintaining the primacy of a particular strain of ideas and resource accumulation can be disrupted through future archives and provenance. I'm also asking whether probab probabilistic computation, building on networked objectivity from subjective data has any chance of establishing meaningful and equitable dialogues with knowledge systems of non-European origins. This talk is also about the intangibles of diaspora between cultures and knowledge systems, offering a rich and inspiring confluence of ideas, which may not comfortably meet with subjective absolutes imposed by today's computation. And Red Earth is also a meditation on our relationship with the natural world. In 1975, Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe gave a lecture at the University of Massachusetts, later published under the title, An Image of Africa, Racism in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. This lecture was a denouncement of Conrad's famed novel and its canonized status as, quote, permanent literature, due to what Achebe considered to be Conrad's direct and explicit racism throughout the novel in its themes, depictions of characters or non-characters, if you were, and the perspective of Conrad's main protagonist, Marlowe, 
who Achibi believed wasn't far removed from the author's disposition. Now, Achibi somewhat rightly questioned what it means if writing or any art that, that can be, according to him, so explicitly racist and go mostly unquestioned by fans and critics alike, regardless of how beautiful the prose or the form of the novel is. And here are a few lines from Achibi's essay. Students of Heart of Darkness will often tell you that Conrad is concerned not so much with Africa as with the deterioration of one European mind caused by solitude and sickness. They will point out to you that Conrad is, if anything, less charitable to the Europeans in the story than he is to the natives. That the point of the story is to ridicule Europe's civilizing mission in Africa. A Conrad student informed me in Scotland that Africa is merely a setting for the disintegration of the mind of Mr. Kurtz, which is, which is partly the point. Africa as a setting and backdrop, which eliminates the African as, as a human factor. Africa as a metaphysical battlefield, devoid of all recognizable humanity, into which the wandering European enters at his peril. Can nobody see the preposterous and perverse arrogance in thus reducing Africa to the role of props for the breakup of one petty European mind? But that is not even the point. The real question is the dehumanization of Africa and Africans, which this age-long attitude has fostered and continues to foster in this world. And the question is whether a novel which celebrates this dehumanization, which depersonalizes a portion of the human race, can be called a great work of art. Now, I, I took in Achibi's words, but something about this essay also unsettled me. I agreed with much of what he said, as I had my own complex relationship with the novel, but I see arguably more nuance with, in Conrad's approach. Yet it felt like Achibi's overall critique of this novel lacked something. And maybe his position could have been even stronger if he had taken his argument self-reflectively a little further. What stuck with me was a question, an important question. As Achibi made this appeal for us to look again at Conrad's work, I was left wondering to whom Achibi was appealing with this essay. Who was the primary audience he assumed to be reading his works, which he had written in English? And was there a moral authority that might hear his claims? And if so, what then? Given Achibi's other novels and essays do much to bring light to the invasion and control of Africa for its vast natural resources, under the guise of moral and technological progress, progress, this essay seemed to lack, lack in such scope, maybe in, in part because it was understandably an emotional plea. So I got stuck on who this moral authority was and is, which who Achibi was trying to reach. I imagine a moral authority, a collective body, wondering somewhat rhetorically who they are, where they're educated and with what information and legacy bestows them with such cosmic authority. Given how our cultural history is so intricately woven with our history of morality, technology and progress through religion, reason, language, wars and subsequent laws, wouldn't it loosely speaking be the same moral authority which has canonized Con Conrad's novel, lauding it as one of the Western world's great works of literature? Roughly around Conrad's birth, Anglican and Baptist missionaries from Britain were beginning to spread the Christian word across Nigeria, systematically implementing a, a proposed order and moral structure. The missionaries and their armed colonial powers came offering bondage under, benevolent, under the benevolent cloak of Christianity. With various means of coercion and more outright violent methods, they found ways to diminish the ancient knowledge systems of the continent. Taking advantage of moral principles of local knowledge and converting populations to Christianity made it markedly easier to coordinate labor and govern over fruitful lands and as managing control across different tribal factions with their own religious and philosophical practices and languages and economic interests would be tricky. Christianity contributed significantly to the psychological work of governing, constraining culture and dissenting thought or ways of seeing and being too alien for these explorers of this resource-rich continent of vast cultural and climate diversity. Christianity existed in parts of the continent before the arrival of the missionaries, 
but they arrived with a very particular purpose. The use of Christianity as part of a strategy of colonial extraction has been effective in a sense, as it has facilitated docility in communities, taken advantage of inherent spiritual and metaphysical commitment, and redirecting this commitment to Christianity. This method went a long way to birthing methods of extraction of natural resources, setting up the intricacies of today's global business infrastructures, still chasing and maintaining economic supremacy. This monotheistic devotion has been beneficial back home in Europe for centuries, keeping the uneducated masses somewhat in line with an overarching and largely invisible moral authority. Roughly a century before the missionary expeditions, the origins of European statistical mathematics and probabilistic methods were unfolding, which went a long way to inform today's computational methodologies like the proliferate machine learning. As you'll know much better than me, aspects of the Bayes theorem, founded by Reverend and early statistician Thomas Bayes, are used today across machine learning models. The Bayes theorem is a mathematical formula for determining conditional prob probability. And conditional probability is the likelihood of an outcome occurring based on a previous outcome having occurred in similar circumstances. So with this theorem, one might establish a belief and later update said belief with newly acquired information, supporting one's argument or intention, which are methods important to today's machine learning methodologies and data analysis informing our pursuit of artificial intelligence. The subjective metaphysical origins of today's widespread statistical methods, like the Bayes theorem, are worth noting. As Justin Yoke notes in his book, Revolutionary Mathematics, Artificial Intelligence Statistics and the Logic of Capitalism, he says, it should be remembered that Thomas Bayes was a man of the cloth. And one of the two essays he published during his life attempted to prove that God wants us to be happy. Here we see the vital and divine connection between a statistical subjective measure of belief and proof that a, trans, a transcendent force watches over the world or a system ensuring its proper functioning. While this subjective force found its justification in a transcendental otherworldly anchor, today it appears to function even without that locus. Yoke goes on to note, according to Bayes and Price, who was Bayes' friend, who found Bayes' seminal work after his death, the discovery of these new mathematical laws allows one to witness the regularity and mathematical design by which God laid out the universe. For them, it likely doesn't matter if others do not share their belief or think, that they the or think by their theological rules. It is sufficient that they know, and God knows. We see here again the structure of objectified belief this is how things work with or without one's individual belief. Yoke goes on to, to say how the market and capital later replace God for non-believing mathematicians and their belief systems. The metaphysical origins of Western statistics have been well documented by mathematicians and historians alike, with much resistance to the Bayesian method, particularly in the 20th century. Still, this method has had a resurgence recently. It is now hugely popular in algorithmic computing, developing truths for capital from various subjective origins, including social origins, which we have established for specific and primarily economic purposes over time. So the subjective Bayes method, Bayesian method, excuse me, beginning with a guess or an idea and adding data to solidify that guess or idea puts us into slippery metaphysical dimension, not too dissimilar to where we might have been in years gone by when, when mono, <clears throat> excuse me, where monotheistic reasoning was leaned on by many to make sense of the world. Therefore, one might speculate the logical endpoint of computation based on this statistical model might eventually aim at a kind of convergence to a truth, whatever that may be, a convergence of dominant beliefs through the accumulation of vast amounts of information with origins already hazy and somewhat originating in a monotheistic belief and notion of morality. So then, the moral authority, would this be the absolute condition of capital? 
As we use algorithmic models to determine who has access to a loan, or whether someone is guilty of a crime or not, to be then placed in for-profit prison systems, does morality or moral authority as we understand it serve a particular purpose, the acquisition and accumulation of capital? The moral authority Achibi appeals to in the 20th century is an English-speaking educated authority of a dominant economic system utilizing progress, culture, education, and development in its service. A few hundred years of Christian influence and legacy intersect with the Enlightenment's emphasis on reason and individualism, along with violent methods of implementing and labor and extraction elsewhere in ways increasingly invisible to us as technology evolves. And they combine to give us critical tenets of the economy we live in today, where race, class, and gender are still practical social factors for accumulating capital through the manipulation of data somewhat controlling our positions within this economic system. The same economic system provides most of the patronage to culture and the arts, which in turn attempts to uphold a particular moral center for us and guide us into how to exist with each other in a, in a society. Culture also systematically maintains primacy for this economic system by maintaining a dominant language and knowledge suppressing influence and dissent. We can even see this in how few works, works of literature from across the world are translated into English until they're deemed worthy of a translation by an authority, the same as which canonizes Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Transhumanism, which seems a, like a rather loose gathering of ideas, aims to optimize the human condition possibly beyond the body and our sentience through new technologies. Much of this technological movement appears unable to imagine ascendancy without thinking of capital, wealth, and wealth enabling more advancement in, in the hands of a few, obviously. The implications of looking at the human condition solely through the lens of capital, elevating capital to a deity seems problematic to me. The fervor around the possibility of AI ascending to a plane beyond us it's, itself is a quasi-spiritual desire, clearly echoing the metaphysical anxieties of the past and our need to see something, possibly something monotheistic, beyond ourselves. It seems now, through probabilistic methods, we form greater knowledge systems to give the impression of an all-seeing, all-doing de deity, and yes, an autonomous moral authority. This supposed moral authority is central to today's technological and economic influence. Social media companies, for example, decide through the same moral lineage what it is of humanity we should and shouldn't say or see. They maintain cognitive call centers in Africa and Asia, taking advantage of long established economic hierarchy to poorly pay employees to screen harmful content before, before excuse me, <clears throat> to screen harmful content before it reaches us making clear to us, if we choose to look, whose welfare is regarded as more valuable, as, as profit from us wealthy consumers, while some, somewhat ironically also, it's been widely reported worsening our mental and emotional welfare as a society. And then, they are, then there are the moral limitations language learning models like ChatGBT apply to what we might ask of it. So I am left wondering what these universal claims to morality are and how we determine objective truths when these truths form in part through a scientific system itself based on the subjective, neglecting the thought, methods, and experiences of large swathes of the human and non-human world, whilst at the same time finding those parts of the world beneficial for material and labor. I'm sure you're all aware of the vast amounts of processing power required for many new technologies, from rare metals needed for increasingly fast and efficient GPUs to the sheer amount of energy used to mine crypto or power machine learning models and 3D rendering. These particular natural resources include, include human data and labor for which the African continent is, is, is gaining increased attention due to its young tech literate population. Google's Equiano project a subsea data cabling route from Portugal to South Africa purports to enable digital transformation in Africa. Language control, 
has been and is one of the most effective ways to control land to access resources. Today, African teachers are even reluctant to teach in native languages, reprimanding students for speaking them. If these languages are suppressed, these cultures and their moral structures are also suppressed. This control of language and consequently local governments contributes to enabling frictionless extraction as there is little opposition or resistance to multinationals. Even within the apparently benign world of literature, European languages determine who is an African writer. As Kenyan writer Ngugi Watiango says, if you're writing in your native language, you're less likely to be read or receive exposure. And I quote from him, securing African languages should be, should be part of a whole vision of Africans securing our resources. The moment we lost our languages was also the moment we lost our bodies, our gold, diamonds, copper, coffee, and tea. The moment we accepted or were made to accept that we could not do things with our languages was the moment we accepted that we could not make things with our vast resources. Translation is uh, central to Ngugi's politics and identity. He says to be divorced from one's mother tongue is a form of slavery, and that language is more than an ordering of words, signs, or patterns, but runs much deeper to an understanding of the self in relation to the earth. As a consequence, many colonized countries struggle to exist in a metaphysical sense between imposed culture and their inherent metaphysics and the disingenuous contradictions of an imposed moral order. My approach to thinking about these issues is a little different. As one of a diaspora with parents from Nigeria but, way, but raised and educated in the UK, I'm always translating my identity and I've always had access to a reality a way of living and being as different from most of the people I grew up around in the United Kingdom, a reality I could not ever really share. As much as I read Conrad, at home, the language spoken, the food eaten, and the ceremonies attended would be of my inherent language and culture, Yoruba. Rather like my existence between cultures, languages, and knowledge systems, I have wondered if there is a way to create a dialogue between prob probabilistic computation based on the previous, previously mentioned and metaphysical foundations from alternative, <coughs> excuse me, based on the previously mentioned and the metaphysical foundations from alternative origins such as Yoruba, which is an ancient culture, or is this idea entirely paradoxical and pointless? The, dias the, the diasporic ex existence, a mesh of worlds, felt like an interesting place to consider combining knowledge systems or at least any impressionistic or metaphysical engagement with those knowledge systems. Mathematics alongside ritual and tradition. As the Nigerian writer Wole Shoinka addresses in his book, Myth, Literature and the African World, there are many parallels one could draw between Yoruba deities and the quote, universal re relevance of Greek gods, significant to the origins of much of Western thought. The Yoruba engagement with a non-linear conception of time beyond the human is one of the driving concepts behind Red Earth. It is one of the temporal concepts Shoyinka addresses in his book, suggesting they are comparable to say Greek mythology or Judeo-Christian theology in their richness and depth. And for Yorubas, the degree of acceptance of something like non-chronological time structure is significant. And I quote, the world of the unborn in the Yoruba worldview is as evidently older than the world of the living as the world of the, li the living is older than the ancestor world. And of course, the other way around. We can insist that the world of the unborn is older than the world of the ancestor in the same breath as we declare that the deities preceded humanity into the universe. Since the resemblance of the Greek pantheon to the Yoruba is often remarked, leading even in some instances of strong scholarly nerve to conclusive evidence for the thesis that the Yoruba religion is derived from the Greek, it is instructive to point out a fundamental contract. Like the Yoruba deities, but to a thousand fold degree, the Greek gods also commit serious infractions against mortal well-being. The Greek catalog is one of lust, greed, 
sadism, megalomania, and sheer cussedness, which I think is an incredible word. But the morality of reparation appears totally alien to the ethical concepts of the ancient Greeks. Punishments when they occur amongst the Olympians invariably take place only when the off offense happens to encroach on the mortal preserves of another deity, and that deity is stronger or successfully appeals to Father Zeus, the greatest reprobate of all. By making the gods responsible to judgments so based, a passive reliance on the whims of external force forces is eschewed, and their regenerative aspects are catalyzed into operation through a ritual recourse to the gods' error-ridden rites of past. Here, Schoenker suggests an inherent alternative morality to the European idea, which may even, to a large extent, be unconscious in Yoruba society. Yet, it indicates some of what I'm attempting to address today. The subtleties which become us in behavior and language and maybe get lost in universalizing computational concepts. <laughs> So um, Red Earth is, is, is a speculative med meditation on what equitable exchange between culture and computation could be, in which I include different modes of translation in a continuous nonlinear process to draw attention to the need for new cultural archives of the future. My experiments with early iterations of GAN translation machine learning models, language to language, language to image, which were born of the probabilistic mentions, methods mentioned, made me think about whether a kind of virtual visual, visualization or distillation of this space between cultures and ideas was possible. Or is computation by its foundational principles unable to engage other metaphysical dimensions than the ones from whence it came? So as poetics drives my creative practice, I decided to eke out a metaphysical realm of my own from which to begin a process of experimentation. I work across disciplines, and this approach is intrinsic, I think, to my way of existing, echoing the diasporic reality I mentioned earlier. And it seemed like a methodology I could apply to this experiment. So as you might have guessed, the name Red Earth comes from the prom prominence of red clay earth, which forms much of the land of West Africa. This color is essentially the result of the earth en enriched by iron and aluminum through heavy rainfall during the rainy season. For this land to be soil and nutritious enough to grow crops, it has to undergo a series of processes, a practice that goes back a long way, but is increasingly modernized. So this, this slide sort of indicates a little bit of how the nonlinear process of applied to develop in this, uh, the entirety of this creative project, working with different forms, different concepts, and flowing back and forth between them. This alchemical process becomes a metaphor for my artistic practice and translations between elements as experienced through Yoruba tradition and the crossing of knowledge systems, cultures and languages through the diaspora. Red Earth is a project less concerned with the specific artistic, with specific artistic objects or a specific goal or output, but more focused on the continuation of thought, idea and language, evocative of Yoruba nonlinear experiences of time through the body and the body's relationship with the non-human environment, earth, fauna, flora, and, and so on. I wanted to establish a process of creation and translation that I could somewhat control rather than simply just allow, you know, allowing automated input and output to collaborate and disrupt the subjective machine processes rather than just passively receive automation. Excuse me. <clears throat> the project begins with photography, which I generally use throughout my work as a, as a note-taking tool to think for a moment or help sketch an idea, a simple record I can use to build on further in prose or a kind of theoretical framework to other forms. I use them as a record whilst they do hold some sort of artistic resonance in themselves. In this case, I extract ideas from the photographs, translating what I read in them without machine, as they become the first in the collection of interlinked forms. Here I include a few examples. 
Amor fati is a Latin phrase, meaning love of fate or love of one's fate. And here's an example of how I go back and forth across cultures. I began to think about the juxtaposition of dynamic mathematical infrastructures within physical matter, from living flesh to the formation of geology over time and the immediacy of emotion and instinct such as fear and doubt, and how we travel over these structures when moving or migrating. See, for example, the generative flow pattern, pattern in, in the fur of the cow and the ever-present spherical systems from micro to macro, and not least reflected in the cow's iris. The theme of natural algorithmic forms flows through this project, tributaries of a river to the structures of trees and the patterning in rocks introduce red earth, which moved this theoretical study and opened up my written response. Thoughts move through non-linear time and space. This traditional engagement with time seems to me to have parallels with virtual time and space, the virtual existing everywhere and nowhere, the immateriality and abstraction of a coordinate. Global linear thinking and its proponents didn't entirely assimilate everything as other customs and other modes of thought offer variants of our reality. See how I apply my subjective reading both to the taking of the photograph and the reading of the photograph. The figure in the photograph is an example of this coming together. He's from a Christian denomination called the Celestial Church of Christ. Deeply but they're deeply infused with local spiritual practices. So coming to the central part of the project is the, the book I've written. Uh, it's a 14,000 word prose poem. And it's the vertebrae of this project. And it responds to the themes that I'm addressing today. Inspired by epic poetry, it meditates on the experience of time, space, life, death, and art between cultures. In this prose, I think about three spaces, the physical world, the virtual world, and the unconscious world, maybe the dream world depending on how you look at it. I use them interchangeably. I split the poem into two long chapters. The first is a meandering monologue on time and space. And the second is a dialogue between two intimately connected entities existing somewhere beyond linear time. And I'll read a short section from the second chapter that's maybe relevant to today. Where the ground shifts beneath one's feet, where one discovers things said into the world can be untrue. In the absence of the certainty of an object, of a body, we slide into the increasing reliance on symbolism, the post-human age. In the absence of discernible life, at least how we knew it, and in the increasing presence of death. Discernible life? Yes, how we walked and talked, and felt the touch of a feather against our skin. Ah, I see, memories. When we walked and wet autumn leaves squelched under our feet, their color running as if over watered gouache, as if they had not begun as independent leaves before they fell. Are they dead before or after they fall? They yellow and curl while still attached to the branches of the tree. This does not mean they're dead. No, it does not. When they reach the ground, they are together. They share color and whatever remains as their respective bodies decompose, disintegrating anything at any moment singular. As we, in fact, amass the dead and the living in data. But if we do not learn from the dead, who do we learn from? Learning from the dead is thinking with them. I am not sure we do this well. We absorb them, consume them, and forget them. So this prose flows through the project in like translated fragments, eventually becoming objects computationally imbued with information. You'll all be familiar with text to image language learning models now, but I'll stick with what I used to begin this project for today's talk. I was particularly interested in the early GAN, GAN, Python models which output compositions of mostly color from textual inputs. These models got me thinking a lot about how we perceive, depending on the circumstances that form our perception, which, constitute what, which then constitutes what we believe. These colorful outputs seem like skin, like how an environment affects the patterning or type of skin on a, 
or hair on an animal, rock or wood. Materials that create deified objects, totems, works of art, representing metaphysical concepts and costumes for spiritual performances, as we often see in Yoruba culture. So throughout the project, I appropriate existing models rather than try to write my own, but I attempt to fit them to purpose, possibly just disrupting their initial objectives. I'm aiming to imbue this skin that I find with my metaphysical distinction through thoughts and poetry. On applying these early models to my prose, the exploratory subjective texts weren't enough for any kind of literal output. And the prose disrupts in its metaphysical sense and in, 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 its, in its use of metaphor. This inability to accurately synthesize what is already a subjective input was the most interesting part of this process when thinking about the truths at the heart of these models. Well, what is the truth the computer is aiming at? Whose tr truth? So these more rudimentary models were more interesting as ontological in-betweens. So I set a few strict rules as to how I would synthesize from the text. I would only translate, translate really small sections or a few lines at a time. I collect the translations in image data, and then I converted that data into 3D mesh data. <clears throat> so having worked in 3D for several years, I've long been interested in the potential simulations of time and space in, in this kind of regard, and how this dimension echoes how non-Freudian cultures engage with dreams. So I take the translation process a bit further, combining another model to create an input mesh from the image data. 3D meshes with vertex, vertex displacements based on coordinates found in the generated image data from changes in color and shape where the model has attempted to calculate some compositional representation of my prose, almost like weather forces, allowing them to form circumstantially as a kind of alternate geology in which the materials or skin are full of the prose data. So everything you see now are extrapolations of my prose. <clears throat> I work on a more kind of manual, I work with a more sort of manual process and combine these skins that I've developed circumstantially through these uh, translations and build them into a series of kind of digital sculptures. They have sort of built in top topographies as a result of the as, as a result of the processes I've already put them through. And these totemic structures that I then started to form were quite evocative of the Yoruba totems, which are often imbued with meaning and messages and sometimes even specific stories. Except traditionally Yoruba totems are obviously more figurative. But there's a similar thing happening in these virtual forms that I've both let happen to some extent in an automated way and then taken over and, and manually sculpted. So what interested me here is how these virtual forms have amassed my prose, my linguistic data embodying the text as it were, and potentially combining a number of them, offering a kind of physical hypercodex, each object or symbol filled with embodied language and metaphysical ideas. Once I began to form these sculptures, I wanted to present in the input and the, and the manually sculpted outputs side by side in a series of diptychs, which is a classical arrangement in the history of Western art. The synthesis of translation laid stark, manual and computational. I manually stamped fragments of the prose into the paper, evoking early printing as it was exported in exchange for land, thinking about the quantification of labor which leads to the second part of each diptych using data as a resource. Some were in frames and some had frames built into the image, looking at the tension between real and unreal, which is an interesting dichotomy to explore. Now this image you're looking at now takes the geological forms from those textual translations a bit further and thinking about how we might arrange them within virtual architectures, either as narratively artistic compositions or as simply as archives of language and heritage evoking how Yoruba culture so often manifests meaning and story in material objects through ritual, reflection, and sometimes gestural demonstrations. Three pieces of text from Red Earth 
make up the elements of this totem. In dialogue here, through gesture, with an entity that exists between worlds, between different ideas of personhood, and in a timeless virtual non-space in between geographic coordinates. Continuing the, the agitated, disruptive conversation I'm having with the past and the future of colonial hierarchies, I position these data sculptures back within my photographs the, in a kind of violence in the purgatorial space between ideas of self and origin they have and others that might have on my behalf, language as an abstract imposition. Now this work more directly speaks to the psychological legacy of Christianity used as a powerful colonial weapon. Virtual totems find their way into my photographs, a gradual, somewhat violent disruption of tradition, themselves disrupted already. So is this with my subjective diasporic input, a coming together or a clashing of ontologies? Is one simply absorbing the other? Or is there any way to establish equitable dialogue? As with most of the pieces in this product, my focus isn't so much on embedding the seductive aura in the works themselves, but instead indulging in a theoretical space where the works are nodes forming a collective thought. In some, I'm actively working against the vernacular of material and seduction, responding to the same in our technocratic processes. This piece uses a textual anal analysis algorithm and outputs patterns looking at associations between the words I'm using, offering an alternative computational narrative. I thought about how this echoes weaving technologies, which is a kind of technological exchange, I guess. And I asked the great textile designers from Ibadan in Nigeria to weave this output onto a, a, Yoruba, a stiff Yoruba cloth used mostly at special events and usually a lot more expressive in its design and embroidery than in the intentional utilitarian way I have designed this here. The fabric originated somewhere around the 18th, sorry, the 16th century, a weaving process started by hand, but now also done with machine. The deep shimmering void here, the vast universe of silence around his words. In this video, which is about 12 minutes long, the prose video of virtual sculptures and virtual environments deriving from the, all the computational translations within the prose that meet to evoke considerations for cultural dissonances experienced by, experienced by existing across geographical and cross-cultural realities, observed through attempts at nonlinear time and space inspired by Yoruba mythology, which can be potentially responded to in virtual space and is also illustrated in part by the looping of the video which plays on and on. Moving image is approached like painting here, moving back and forth between worlds, the virtual incarnation of the discord that can come from a restricted culture and access to language, culture and origin. Infinite open worlds are hinted at. How might we evolve the representation of alternative cosmologies of thought? So you'll see that this is very much a speculative, speculative exercise about language and data, but also whose language and consequently whose authority. And yes, morality is now encoded into our digital realities. I'm asking if that entrenches the negation covered here in ways that move exponentially much faster and more granular, granularly than we can comprehend. And whether there's any room for provenance within this data, or is it inherently flawed? And that, that is simply the underwhelming and even violent trajectory for the autonomy of alternate cultures, moral ideas, and outlooks. Are the works I am producing here aberrations or possibilities? I want to conclude with another quote from Achibi's essay, where he gets close to, but stops short of, critiquing the moral authority his essay aims at. It might be contended, of course, that the attitude to the African in Heart of Darkness is not Conrad's, but that of his fictional narrator, Marlowe, and that far from endorsing it, Conrad might indeed be holding it up to irony and criticism. Certainly, Conrad appears to go to considerable pains to set up layers of insulation between himself and the moral universe of his history. He has, for example, a narrator behind a narrator, 
The primary narrator is Marlowe, but his account is given to us through the filter of a second shadowy person. But if Conrad's intention is to draw a cordon sanitaire between himself <laughs> and the moral and psychological malaise of his narrator, his care seems to me totally wasted because he neglects to hint, however subtly or tentatively, at the alternate, alternative frame of reference by which we may judge the actions and opinions of his characters. It would not have been beyond Conrad's power to make that provision if he had thought it necessary. Now I'll bring that to a close there. Thank you. <laughs>